I'm Mike DeLuca. Welcome to this in-depth and rare look at the craft of screenwriting. Today, we're lucky enough to be joined by Sheldon Turner, who most recently penned the remake of The Longest Yard and has about a half a dozen projects in development around town. Welcome, Sheldon. Thanks, Mike. Good to be here. Now, you actually graduated from NYU Law School. Shockingly. Can you believe it? <laughs> I know. I know. The standards are so low. It's an interesting uh, background for a screenwriter. How did you make that transition? It, well, I always wanted to be a lawyer. Like, I have a father who's a high school dropout imposed on me to sort of get the education he never did. And I bought in hook, line, and sinker. I essentially wanted to be Atticus Finch. The first day of law school disabused me of that fact, but I have a mom who would kick my ass if I didn't finish. Mm -hmm. So I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. I had had at that point some short stories, an op-ed piece uh, published. I knew I liked writing. I didn't know I could necessarily make a living at it. The beginning of my third year, right before I did a legal internship at a big pharmaceutical company where essentially there was nothing for me to do all day. I would sit in the corner. The lawyers didn't know who I was, what I was doing there, who's the weird kid in the corner. And, uh, and I just started to read like five newspapers a day. And I, I always had a love of movies inherently and always liked to write. So I wrote my first screenplay, which was an utter piece of shit. But it was enough to say, like, God, I love this thing. And enough for me to go to my folks and persecute them with, uh, you know, like, hey, you know the money you guys just helped me get through law school with? I'm going to go be a screenwriter, you right. know? And I don't know anybody out there. But, uh, you know, I'm glad that I was stupid enough to do that. Was there a particular moment where you gained the confidence that you could be a screenwriter? Or was there one thing that made you feel like, I could do that? For me, it was always about, because, you know, screenwriters always ask you, like, what is it you do? Do you read? Do you go, you know, do you take courses? I never took a course. What I did is I read every screenplay I can get my hands on. And, and it was ultimately emboldening and dispiriting. More so, and I tell people, go and find the crappy screenplays, because they are abundant, man. And, and that's what my inspiration was to a degree. So I would be out there struggling. And I wrote 12 screenplays before I gave one to anybody. Literally, I was writing, like, a script a month. Editing was not a huge priority at that point. And I just put them on the shelf. And then the 12th one, actually, the 13th one, I, uh, I finally felt like I hit it. I felt good enough about it to give it out to people, and that was, of course, the first thing I went out and sold. But I knew I had to get that training ground in. I didn't feel comfortable enough with it. I didn't think I hit my voice on it enough. So, again, it's working it out on the page and finding the answers through those sorts of things. But for me, I, I, there was one script in particular that I read during the time that, that sold to Sony, actually, for like $3 million, and it was an utter piece of shit. And I, I remember there were two pages in it, which, amazingly enough, this writer had managed to encapsulate every cliche in the uh -huh. human lexicon in two pages. I mean, it was fantastic. So I literally tore it up and put it in my little crappy studio apartment and put it on the wall as a source of inspiration. I mean, anger is a great energy, and, and I fully accept that that's part of what like fueled me at that point. I hear uh, this crazy thing about you working out uh, at 4 in the morning before you write every day. <laughs> I get up at 3.57. I have my whole routine. I, I'll write for an hour, and then I'll go to the gym and work out for an hour and a half, two hours. And it's not for any other reason than, of course, self-loathing, which I find to be the most productive part of my day. Guilt and fear. I always say I'm motivated by guilt and fear. And also because I don't habitate the middle ground well. I'm an extremist. So I'm, if I'm not getting up at 3.57, I'm getting up at 1. And it's one of the good things and bad things about being a writer. You, if, unless you're disciplined, it's very easy to fall by the wayside and sort of be the ultimate procrastinator and put things off. So I go to the other extreme. Do you have specific goals in mind or a timeline when you sit down to start? I, I try not to. I mean, you know, there are always days that are better than others. You try to, I've heard of writers who have like the, I need to get 10 pages in a day. I need to get five in a day. For me, it's more about the time. You know, if, if I don't, if I have meetings during the day, if I have other obligations, whatever it might be, either way, I have to get it in. So if it's a matter of me staying up later that night, I prefer, I like the morning hours just because it's, it's quiet. The phone's not going to ring. You're less likely to get a phone call at 357. Where do you find your inspiration? Anywhere. I mean, that's the beauty of, for me, it's often music. When I'm driving, when I'm doing anything that's sort of seemingly right. leisure, leisurely or anything like that, when you're thinking. I think all too often now, we as a society train ourselves to not have time to think. You get home, you turn the TV on. You get in the car, you turn the radio right. on. You do whatever it is. I think often those moments come in solitude, you know, when you, when you find that inspiration or it's themes, you know, and, mm -hmm. I, and I accept that, like, you know, you don't, you don't want to put somebody in a situation to go down the hall and tell Amy Pascal that Sheldon Turner has some wonderful themes he wants right. to explore in this movie. But I think that's what makes for really good, even in something like Longest Yard, which is, you know, problem and right. fun movie and all that. You've got to, at least for me, I've got to know what the themes are. Even something like Redemption, whatever it is, that's what makes interesting movies. I right. think if you're just writing for page 33, I've got to hit the point where the star-crossed lovers meet the giant giraffe. Right then it's going to feel like that. It's going to read like that on the page, and it's going to come across like that on the screen. 
do you outline before you write? I do it, I do it regardless, mm -hmm. but I think ultimately writers that write really good outlines write really, really bad scripts. You know, because you never know. Again, uh, things happen on the page, man. You've got to be open to it instinctively. There are two kinds of writers. There are the mechanical writers who can chart all that stuff mm -hmm. out, and it's similar to artists who go and, you know, they know exactly where they're going to do things. Right. And then there are instinctive writers who sort of like, yeah, I can give you the basis of it. And often I, I write. So before I even get to an outline, I've had projects where I've written a script or a good portion of it, and then they've asked for an outline. So I have to go back, and there are parts that I know work in a script right. that I know in static description on an outline are not going to play. So what I have to do at that point is leave it out or preclude it or, right. or put it in a different way where it sounds good. The same way I always say there's a difference between selling pitches and writing scripts. There are things that play in a room and sound really cool, but you know full well when you get on the page it's not going to play. Um, and I think it's important to know the difference. It's something I'm still learning. When you are writing, do you have any rules about how much action or um, description you put into your scripts? Uh, you know, two lines. I, tr I try never to go longer than two lines of action because I think the eye just naturally drifts away. We all do it. Right. Uh, you know, you look at the script and there are breezy reads. Scott Rosenberg, to me, it, it pioneered how to do a breezy quick read. He had the great structure, and that's really to give a prop out to Scott Rosenberg. Right. Is is like how I read his stuff, and I'm like he really. Got it down. I read that Project Greenlight script, or I tried to, Stolen Summer, that thing, and I, it was like one long paragraph. Right. I don't know what, I don't know, it was like Stolen Paragraph. I don't know where <laughs> the, there was no, uh, it was the hardest thing in the world to read. What do you do when you're stuck on a particular project? Do you ever get stuck and need to kind of like... It's one of the reasons I, I like having different projects at once. Not so much because I get stuck, but just because I, I always say like, like it's sort of like being a, the bicycle economy. It's easier when you're pedaling fast. As soon as you start to slow down, that's when the bike topples over. So I don't necessarily ever have those. My mantra is just keep writing. Whatever it is, write through it. If it's, if it's not good, then throw it out. If it's shit, then so be it, you know? But just keep writing. I think most of the solutions to, to those quandaries can come from just writing it out rather than sitting there and like research or whatever that, that thing is that so many people do. For me, it's just the answers are on the page, you know? Can anything prepare you for life as a screenwriter? For me, it's just reading everything. I mean, I, I still read five newspapers a day. I try to read a book a week. I read a script a day. All those things, there's not enough time in the day to, to sort of get those things. And at the end of the day, you, I believe it's like the 90 mile per hour fastball. You have it or you don't. You can hone those skills. Uh -huh. But it's why I don't get invited to talk at those screenwriting conferences. Because ultimately, my first question is, what are you guys doing here? Because right. in a way, they're, they're teaching everyone to do the same thing. And the one thing, I mean, you look at it from a perspective of a producer or an executive who's got to take home 10 scripts in a weekend or, or a night take home three scripts. Uh -huh you got to do something to differentiate yourself because you have a limited time. Everybody tells the great lie of like, oh, I read the whole script. Bullshit. Right. Nobody does. They read 10, 20 pages. You have a finite amount of time to hook somebody. So you better do it. And if you're, if you're getting the same skills or being taught the same skills, proselytize the same skills as, 30 other pe as 300 other people in a room, then what's the point? I mean, find a way to differentiate yourself. Right. I wish screenwriting now were just about writing. I do, but it's not. I mean, actually, I think it's probably 40% of it. I think a lot of it is you've got to be a social animal now. Right. You've got to go out there. You've got to be able to deal with things. You've got to be good in a room. I mean, ideally, you're good on a page and you're good in the room, but those are the things that are important. I mean, the sort of the fallacy, the, 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 the ancient legend of sort of the, 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 you know, the antisocial uh, writer, they're out there, and sometimes you make it work for you. I right. mean, Charlie Kaufman has certainly turned it into a cottage industry. Right. But for the most part, I think you can't afford to do that. Is there one piece of wisdom uh, that pertains to screenwriting that you just can't hear enough that you feel is the, an overriding piece of wisdom that everyone should know about screenwriting? Uh, you know, I, I, more or less, I, I think in terms of things that I debunk as the sort of classics, the things that people tell you, write about what you know. Right. I, you know what, if I wrote about what I knew, it'd be the most boring scripts in history. You know? right. I mean, I think there are thing, emotional connections that you have, things that you can identify with. But for the most part, if you write about what you know, it's why there are people out there who say, like, this is the most amazing script. I'm, you're too close to it, for right. one. Because that moment when you went away to summer camp and Joey had that accident on the boat, Nobody really gives a shit. You know, right. it's important to you because it was a seminal moment. And it'll come across that way maybe on a script, but in a bigger sense, it doesn't resonate like that. So that's a fallacy, I always thought. To me, it's just keep writing and read everything you can get your hands right. on. And I do believe that writers are born. I think that, I think you can make yourself better as a writer. I think you can take all the courses you want if you don't have it in you. If you don't have that voice in your head, I always say screenwriters are schizophrenics. The only difference is rather than talking back to the voices, you write them down. Right. And I think that's kind of the way, like, truly there is a torturous content to it, absolutely, and a bit of a myth. 
but there's also a sense of there are stories in that you just have to tell. And at, at the end of the day, whether you're a director, a producer, or anything in the film industry, you have to love story. Mm -hmm.